what are they called? Chorea. And this type of chorea, which develop as a part of rheumatic fever, or usually chorea develops during the fever, or in some patient, chorea develops few months after the fever. But anyway, chorea is one of the very diagnostic feature of the rheumatic fever. This chorea is also called, it has two more names. This is also called, number one, rheumatic chorea. Some people call it Sydenham's, Sydenham's. Yes, Korea, and some people call it Saint Vitus Dance. Saint Vitus Dance. You can call it whatever you love, right? The thing is that you must remember that this is more common in females. It's more common in females, right? Now, so what we now the second important tissue in which the attack of the rheumatic fever is there, our immune system cross react is cardiac tissue. Right? But I will discuss about the cardiac tissue later. Right? Before, uh, I would like to cover the other three tissues before. So already we have covered the central nervous system. That whenever immune system cross react with central nervous system, it may produce chorea. And you have to remember one thing, that chorea is not a very common uh, presentation of this disease. But whenever it is there, it is very, very diagnostic. Another important thing is that the patient who develop chorea, once the fever is over, right, patient is out of the acute phase and immune system is no more damaging the central nervous system, recovery is complete. Again, it's worth repeating that once rheumatic process, right, or immune process damages the central nervous system and patient develop chorea, right, once the chorea subsides, there is no long-term residual damage to the central nervous system. After that, we'll talk about the cardiac pathology later. Let's talk about joints, right? About the joints, uh, what the points which you have to remember that these patients develop arthritis or arthralgia, right? Suppose this is a joint and here is your synovial membrane. Right, this is synovial membrane. Actually, immune system cross react with the synovial membranes, and synovial membranes become inflamed, and that produces severe inflammation of the joints. Now, when joints are inflamed, right, we call the condition arthritis, arthritis. But if patient complains just of the pain in the joint, only pain in the joint, then we call it arthralgia, arthralgia. Now, you must know the real difference between arthralgia and arthritis. In arthritis, there is more severe inflammation. So patient has painful joints. Patient had painful tender joint. When you touch the joint, they are painful. Patient complain about the pain. And when you touch the joints, they are painful, painful, tender, swollen joint. Painful, painful tender and swollen joints. Is that right? That is what is arthritis. But if patient complain, that he has pain in a joint, but when you check, there's no tenderness and no swelling, right? Then we say that there's no full, not full-blown arthritis. We say patient is having just arthralgia, right? Uh, and it's important to remember arthritis is one of the major criteria to diagnose the disease. And arthralgia is one of the minor criteria. So as a doctor, you are supposed to know the difference in arthritis and arthralgia. Is that clear? Just painful joint, no swelling, no tenderness, no other features of inflammation, arthralgia. Severely painful joint, tender joint, swollen joints, right? This is arthritis. Now, these patients classically develop polyarthritis. Polyarthritis mean? Yes. Polyarthritis mean multiple joints are inflamed, right? And another very special feature of this disease is that for few days, patient has severe pain in the ankle joint. After that, they will do, uh, ankle joint will become okay and patient develops severe pain in knee joints. And then pain in the knee joints or arthritis in knee joints starts settling and patient may develop problem into another group of joints like wrist joints. So this type of uh, arthritis, polyarthritis, in which at different time, during the different time of the disease course, different group of the joints are inflamed. We call this condition migratory polyarthritis. Migratory, migratory 
polyarthritis. Again, let me repeat that in rheumatic feet inflamed, we say there is arthritis, right? Because multiple joints are inflamed, we call this polyarthritis. And usually, the inflammatory pattern of the joint, it changes with the time. So we can say arthritis is migrating within the patient. So we call it migratory polyarthritis. Usually, as you know, that this disease, the first attack of the disease is more common between the age of 5 to 15 years. The peak incidence is between the 5 to 15 years. This disease is rare before the 4 years of age and it is and first attack is rare after the 40. The most commonly the rheumatic fever attacks the patients somewhere between 5 to 15 years. So usually these are the children who are brought to you with rheumatic fever. Now one thing which is very important when a child is brought to you with rheumatic fever and which child has very severe polyarthritis the point which you have to remember, this arthritis is extremely severe and pain is very, very severe. And we have a magic drug to manage this pain. Very commonly used drug, that is aspirin. Very simple, we give very, very high doses of aspirin and symptoms of the joint inflammations really uh, disappear very rapidly. But remember one thing that we should not give the aspirin until migratory nature of the arthritis is not clear. For example, you are sitting in the emergency and a child is brought by the mother and child has uh, high grade fever and with that he has multiple joints inflammation, right? But if you ask the mother that what was the pattern of the joint inflammation, she says a baby developed this problem or child developed this problem only three days back and they were, they were only ankle swollen. Now you are not sure that is it migratory or not migratory because if polyarthritis is migratory then it is most probably it is rheumatic fever and if it is not migratory we have to reconsider the diagnosis. Remember if you label a person or child with the disease of rheumatic fever there are a lot of social consequences of this diagnosis, the lot of financial consequences of this diagnosis, the lot of clinical consequences of this diagnosis. They're very, very serious. For example, there's a seven-year-old child which come to you and you really label the child with rheumatic fever. You know, if he's labeled with rheumatic fever, maybe up to the age of 25, he has to take prophylactic antibiotics daily. Up to the age of 25, the child should be given antibiotic prophylactically so that streptococcus does not attack again. Or if you don't manage this patient well, many of these patients of rheumatic fever, right, they develop long-term cardiac problems and long-term valvular problems. So again, listen carefully that when a child come and you are going to make a diagnosis of rheumatic fever, it's very important not to over-diagnose and not to under-diagnose because if you over-diagnose, it means you are wrongly putting the patient who are not rheumatic fever with the label of rheumatic fever. You know what will happen? You are wrongly committing a patient or baby for many, many years, for many, many years of antibiotics daily or depopenicillin every month injection. That's a big mistake. And at the same time, you should not under-diagnose this disease. For example, if there is a baby who is really having, child who is really having rheumatic fever and you don't diagnose it properly, what will happen? You miss the patient and maybe this patient repeatedly develops rheumatic fever and diagnosis is not made very rapidly within a few years that child may develop valvular heart diseases. 